counsel? Your Honor, I have concluded my cross-examination. Microphones off, sir. You'd think after three months I would have learned this. I've concluded my cross-examination. I had indicated before that we needed a conference prior to that, and I think we may have resolved that issue. Okay. Don't need to do that. I will require an additional conference, but it does not have to be until the conclusion of redirect examination. And before the witness is excused, I would like to have a conference. It doesn't need to be in the presence of the jury. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Garrigus, during February and March of 2003, did you know whether or not Janet Arvizo ever told anyone she wanted to go to Brazil with Michael Jackson? Objection. Lack of foundation. Lack of personal knowledge. Sustained. Mr. Garrigus, during February or March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge of whether or not Janet Arvizo ever told anyone she wanted to go to Brazil with Michael Jackson? Personal knowledge being limited to conversations with Janet Arvizo? Just a moment. Sustained. During February or March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge of whether or not Janet Arvizo wanted Michael Jackson to get her a new home? I'm going to object to personal knowledge and vague. Your microphone's off. Sustained. Mr. Garrigus, during February and March of 2003, was it your understanding that Janet Arvizo wanted possessions moved out of her apartment in East LA, wanted those possessions stored, and wanted someone else to pay for it? I'll object as to lack of foundation and speculation. And compound. And compound. Sustained. Mr. Garrigus, during February and March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge of whether Janet Arvizo wanted to move out of her apartment on Soto Street in East Los Angeles? Yes, or, no. I'll object beyond, yes, or, no. You may answer that, yes, or, no. Yes. And what was your knowledge based upon? Based on my conversation with Brad Miller. During February and March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge of whether or not Janet Arvizo wanted someone to retrieve her possessions from the apartment on Soto Street? From Brad Miller, I. I'll object, Your Honor, as a lack of foundation. I'll strike the answer, but you are to answer that question, yes, or, no. It's a question about, do you want it read back? Yes, was the answer to the question. And what was your personal knowledge based upon? Conversations with Brad Miller. And what was your personal knowledge? I'll object as hearsay. Overruled. That she wanted the, she wanted to move in with her boyfriend, she wanted those items stored, and that she arranged with Brad to do that. I'm going to move to strike as hearsay. It was his personal knowledge, your honor. Well. If it's for the truth of the matter. Just a moment, just a moment. This is another one of those situations where that is what he testified to under your cross-examination. The objection is overruled. Next question. Mr. Garrigus, during February and March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge of whether Janet Arvizo wanted the storage costs for storing her possessions paid for by someone else? Yes. And what was your personal knowledge based upon? Conversations with Brad Miller. And what was your personal knowledge about that subject? Objection. Hearsay. Overruled. You may answer. Precisely that. That she wanted the items stored there and she wanted somebody else to pay for them. During February and March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge about whether or not Janet Arvizo was planning to go to Brazil with Michael Jackson? If I did, it would be the same answer I gave to Mr. Zonin, that the conversations would have been either through Brad or through Dickerman's conversations, which would have stretched into April and May. During February and March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge of whether or not Janet Arvizo changed her mind about Brazil when she decided Michael Jackson was not going with her? I don't think that that was in February or March of 2003 that I heard that. During February and March of 2003, did you know whether or not Janet Arvizo was using the Soto Street address in East Los Angeles to defraud welfare authorities? Objection. Exceeds the scope of the cross-examination. Lack of foundation. Also legally speculative. The objection is sustained. It's argumentative. During February and March of 2003, Mr. Garrigus, 
Did you have any personal knowledge of what purpose Janet Arvizo had in keeping that Soto Street address? Objection. Speculative. Lack of foundation, and irrelevant. All right. You may answer that, yes, or, no. I'll overrule the objection. Can I answer it? I don't know. Yes. That's an option. Okay. I don't know. During February and March of 2003, Mr. Garrigus, did you have any personal knowledge of whether or not Janet Arvizo arranged to have someone else pay the rent at Soto Street? Yes. And what was your personal knowledge based upon? Conversations with Brad. And what was your knowledge about that? Brad said that she wanted the rent paid and I believe at some point produced some document from the landlord, or something like that, that I saw later on after February or March. And was it your personal knowledge in February and March of 2003 that someone else actually paid Janet Arvizo's rent for the Soto Street address? I was told that. By who? Brad. And what were you told? That he had paid it. Did you learn how many months he had paid Janet Arvizo's rent at Soto Street? I think he told me too. Did you ever learn for how many months Brad Miller paid Janet Arvizo's storage costs? Only through Mr. Zanin's questioning. Okay. You didn't know. I didn't know at the time. I think I had assumed it was from the time that the storage, or the items had gone into storage to the time that I was dealing with Dickerman, which would have been, I don't know, 45 or 60 days, something like that. Now, during February and March of 2003, was it your understanding that Janet was spending most of her time living at Jay Jackson's apartment? I'll object. Lack of foundation. Overruled. You may answer. I knew she was. I believe she was there on February 16th, because that was when that tape recording was made with her and the family and I believe with her then boyfriend. And I know that Brad told me that they were spending time there, that they had moved in there. So I don't know that I can tell you back in February or March exactly which days they were there off the top of my head, but I know that I was aware of the fact that they were there. Now, in cross-examination. You stated words to the effect that you wanted a videotape of the movement of Janet Arvizo's possessions from the Soto Street address, right? I specifically have a memory of telling Brad, if you're going to do that, you better videotape it, so that nobody's later going to accuse you of taking some of the possessions. And was it your understanding in February and March of 2003 that, in fact, the move was videotaped by Mr. Miller? He told me that was, something to the effect that that was a good idea and I assumed he did it. Okay. Now, in February and March of 2003, were you aware of any effort by Mr. Miller to hide from anybody where those possessions were stored? On the contrary, I think he wanted to turn it over and get off the hook for paying for them. And to your knowledge, in February, March of 2003, was the storage locker in the name of Brad Miller, licensed private investigator? I believe that it was. Did you know, in February and March of 2003, whether anyone else's possessions, separate and apart from Janet Arvizo, were in that locker? No, not back in February, March of 2003. Okay, now, the prosecutor asks you questions about whether or not a private citizen has a right to record a telephone conversation if they think a crime is going to be committed, right? That's correct. And in February and March of 2003, what was your knowledge about the right of a private citizen to record a conversation if they think a crime is going to be committed? My knowledge of the penal code has always been that there is a code section in the penal code that allows a private citizen to do that if there are certain enumerated crimes that you expect to occur, and that you're gathering evidence. And one of those crimes is extortion, correct? That's correct. If a private citizen reasonably believes someone might be attempting to commit extortion, they can, in fact, lawfully record a phone conversation without the other party's consent, right? That's my understanding of the law, and I believe that there's an addition to the code section that there is a specific case, although I don't have access to Lexis right now. I do use Lexis, not Westlaw, and I would assume that I could find that case that also has interpreted that code section the same way. Now, you indicated that when you first were retained by Mr. Jackson, you did a quick search and learned about the J.C. Penney case filed by Janet Arvizo and her children, correct? Correct. Did you know at that point in time that Janet Arvizo was arrested that day? Objection. Beyond the scope. Overruled. You may answer. I believe if it wasn't that day, it was very shortly thereafter. During February and March of 2003, 
Mr. Garrigus, did you think or reasonably suspect that the Arvizos might attempt to extort Michael Jackson? That was exactly what my concern was. Did your knowledge of the J.C. Penney case cause you concern in that regard? Combined with the fact that there had been an arrest, I thought that the fact that the civil lawsuit was being used to blunt the criminal case is what gave me great pause. What do you mean by that? The civil case appeared, at least, to be an outgrowth of a criminal incident, and I just had grave concerns about that. Are you suggesting that Miss Arvizo used a civil case to nullify her arrest? That thought had crossed my mind. Have you seen that happen before? Yes. Did you ever, in February and March of 2003, represent Mark Schaffel? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think I ever represented Mark Schaffel. In February and March of 2003, did you represent Dieter Weisner? No. In February and March? No. In February and March of 2003, did you represent Ron Konitzer? No. In February and March of 2003, did you represent Frank Tyson? No. In February and March of 2003, did you represent Vinnie Amen? No. Now, in February and March of 2003, Mr. Garrigus, did you ever give legal advice to Mark Schaffel? No. In February and March of 2003, did you ever give legal advice to Dieter Weisner? No. In February and March of 2003, did you ever give legal advice to Ron Konitzer? To the extent that they would ask questions and I would, Ronald would ask questions about specific things and whether they should do things, and I would say I want it run by me if it was, for instance, they're going to make a statement, or they're going to issue some kind of a press release or something, I would say, please let me have some input into that. Now, in February and March of 2003, did you ever give legal advice to Frank Tyson? No. In February and March of 2003, did you ever give legal advice to Vinnie Amen? No. Now, is the statute you're referring to that allows a private citizen in California to secretly record a conversation if they think there's a reasonable belief that extortion might happen, is that Penal Code 633.5? I believe that it is, because I think the section that prohibits it is 632. So it would be my guess, at least, that it's the 630 section or 633. And prior to February and March 2003, were you aware of instances where, in fact, private citizens have secretly recorded others who they thought were going to try to commit a crime? Yes, in numerous instances. And in fact, private investigators sometimes do that if they think they're going to get evidence of a crime, correct? That's as a private citizen. A private investigator has no more and no less rights than a private citizen. So I am aware of various private investigators doing that, only with the caveat that they have that expectation that a crime is going to be committed. Now, was there anything else about Janet Arvizo that made you suspicious that she might try to shake down Mr. Jackson other than what you've described? Not other than what I've described to you and to Mr. Zonin. In February and March of 2003, did you have any personal knowledge that Janet Arvizo had told anyone that her husband came from a family of drug dealers? No, not, not that I remember. In February and March of 2003, did you have any knowledge of Janet Arvizo claiming that her husband was using all of their money on a drug habit? No, I don't believe so. In February and March of 2003, were you aware of any bank accounts Janet Arvizo had set up allegedly for the benefit of her son? I'm going to object unless counsel has a good faith offer of proof that the answer is, yes. Because otherwise it's simply inadmissible questions. Overruled. You may answer. I may answer? Yeah. I, I believe that I had received information, but I don't think that I was able to verify it in February or March. I had just, what I would call, suggestions that was the case. But I did not have anything to substantiate it. Now, in February and March of 2003, Mr. Garrigus, did you have any personal knowledge of Janet Arvizo trying to get money from various celebrities? I, not from celebrities. I had knowledge of her trying to get money from other people but not from various celebrities. When you retained Brad Miller in February of 2003, was that your first effort to have an investigator investigate the Arvizos? Do you mean had I used any other investigator prior to Brad? Yes. No, I had not. I don't believe I have used any other investigator in February. Okay, 
So Brad Miller was the first licensed investigator you ever retained to investigate the activities of the Arvizos? Yes. Now, you said that the period of surveillance and investigation by Mr. Miller was approximately 35 days, is that right? Give or take. It was, it started in February and it ended sometime in March. And to your knowledge, was Mr. Miller doing an investigation into public records involving Ms. Arvizo other than the J.C. Penney case? Yes. What other public records do you believe he was examining as part of his investigation into the Arvizos in February and March of 2003? Objection. Irrelevant. Exceeds the scope of the cross. I don't think it does, Your Honor. The objection is overruled. You may answer. I believe that he had checked. I mentioned before that he had checked what are called the civil indexes, which are a list of cases that people file in civil court. I believe he also checked the criminal indexes, and I believe he came up with various cases that she was listed as either a complaining witness or involved in one way or another or as a witness. And did the information you were aware of in February and March of 2003 about the Arvizos and their record of civil litigation and non-civil litigation concern you? Yes. Did you believe that what you knew about the Arvizos in February of 2003 almost required you to put them under surveillance? All object as speculative and argumentative. Sustained. In your experience, prior to February of 2003, when a lawyer like yourself is concerned about a client being extorted or shaken down, typically what does the lawyer do? I know what I do in that situation, is I want to find out everything I can about the person who I've got concerns about. And if I think that I can, that I'm going to get somewhere with having somebody check them out, I'll have an investigator check them out. And I believe that any lawyer who gets hired by a client has an ethical obligation to do that. And in February and March of 2003, was it your understanding that putting someone under surveillance by a licensed private investigator was lawful? To my understanding. Objection. Asked and answered. The answer is in. The objection is overruled. In February and March of 2003, when you put the Arvizo family under surveillance through a licensed private investigator, was this the first time you had done such a thing? That I had had somebody investigated in. Objection. Asked and answered. Sustained. Now, Mr. Garrigus, the prosecutor asked you questions about what you did with these passports when you located them, okay? Yes. And what you did was, you had them lodged with this particular court, correct? I told one of the lawyers in my office to take them to Judge Melville's court. I believe we prepared some kind of notice of lodging, and we notified the court of what we were doing, and it was lodged, I believe, with the clerk of the court. And that would be Judge Melville's court? Yes. Is there any reason why you preferred giving those passports to Judge Melville rather than Janet Arvizo? I believed that they were something that both, either Mr. Snedden or yourself would want for various reasons. I believed that based upon that, that they had evidentiary value. I believed that I had no business holding on to them myself, and I didn't want to put you in a position where you would have to be a witness and be conflicted out of the case. So I made the decision, after consulting with numerous lawyers, that the best thing to do was to file them directly with the court, which I thought was my ethical, also my ethical obligation. And when you did that, were the passports addressed to Judge Melville? I believe, I assume that the document is here. I believe a document was prepared by my office in connection with the lodging when it was filed. Either a notice of lodging or a notice of filing. I believe I saw something to that effect. Now, you knew when you lodged those passports with Judge Melville's court that Janet Arvizo wanted them, right? Well, I would assume that those were things that would go to Janet Arvizo, Gavin, Starr, and the daughter, yes. And my question is, were you concerned about what Ms. Arvizo or her attorney, Mr. Dickerman, might do with those passports? Well, I knew that it was, that it was not going to be a great situation when I filed it with the court. I wasn't happy that I was in that situation. I gave consideration, or at least thought about the idea of turning them over to Mr. Dickerman, but thought that it made more sense to do it with the court so that there was at least a record that, in the chain of custody, so to speak, so you could document where they were and what had happened. I wasn't comfortable with the fact of giving them back to Mr. Dickerman. I thought that the thing to do, and several other lawyers that I talked to, that the thing to do was to lodge them with the court. Now, you indicated on cross-examination that you did not trust Mr. Dickerman, correct? That's correct. Why? Because I would get. I'll object as irrelevant. 
Sustained. At the time you lodged those passports with this court, did you know whether or not Janet Arvizo was represented by attorney Larry Feldman? Yes, I did know that. Did you ever consider giving those passports to attorney Larry Feldman? Objection. Irrelevant. Sustained. I have no further questions. Did Mr. Miller tell you in advance that he was going to go ahead and pay a couple months' rent of Ms. Arvizo's? I don't know. I can't tell you. I know that he paid the rent. I don't know if he told me after he did it or before. Would Mr. Miller be willing to pay my next month's mortgage? I don't know. How big is your house? I live in Santa Barbara. It's small. But I'm sure expensive. Mr. Garrigus, did he talk with you at all in advance about the propriety of Michael Jackson's employees paying Miss Arvizo's rent? Did who? Did Brad Miller speak with you in advance of paying that month's rent or two months' rent? Mr. Zonin, my experience with Mr. Jackson is that this is a man with great. The question is, did Mr. Brad Miller speak with you in advance? You asked me about the propriety of Mr. Jackson's employees. No, the question. I was trying to answer that. Is, did Mr. Brad Miller speak with you in advance of doing that? The answer is the same one I gave you when you asked me the first time, which was I don't remember as I sit here if he told me before or after, but I know at some point I knew. When did you first learn about it? I don't know, sometime in February or March. What was Mr. Miller's explanation to you as to why he felt it was a good thing to do? I don't know that I quizzed him on it. Now, you said that you wanted that videotape to be done in advance of the move out of the apartment, is that right? I wanted, if he was going to move, I wanted him to videotape the move. I didn't feel comfortable having him handle her possessions because I thought she would come back later and make some accusation that something was taken out of there, or that she had some, who knows. That there was going to be five refrigerators in a $10,000 stove. So you knew about this in advance of them moving her out of the apartment? I knew that he was going to move her, because as I said before, I told him, if you're going to do that, you better videotape it. And that means, yes, you knew in advance of them moving her out of the apartment, that she was going to do, that they were going to do so in advance, is that right? I knew that he was going to help her move, and I told him to videotape it. All right, and you knew that they had not yet commenced the move? Well, I would assume that. Yes, I would assume that. So you still had the opportunity to tell Brad Miller, what? Are you nuts? Don't do anything for Janet Arvizo. Objection. Argumentative. Sustained. I'll leave out the, are you nuts? The objection is sustained. Did you tell Brad Miller, don't do it? Don't move her stuff. Don't have anything to do with her. No. Did you tell him that you believed that she was ready to engage in a shakedown of Michael Jackson and you ought not be conducting any business with her or association with her? No, on the contrary, I wanted to know what she was up to. Did Brad Miller tell you, up to that point, that she had ever said that she wanted money from Michael Jackson? Yes. For what? She felt that she deserved money. She wanted, you know, he was wealthy and she wanted money. How much? I didn't how much she wanted. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to recommend that my client pay the money. When did that conversation take place? It would have been sometime shortly after we discovered that she had filed suit against J.C. Penney. Then why did you tell him to go ahead and proceed and move her stuff out of the apartment? I did not want him to lose track of her. I didn't want her to go into the ether, because I was afraid that she would do exactly what she ended up doing in this case which is get into the hands of a lawyer who would refer her to a psychiatrist, and all of a sudden we'd get a false accusation. Now, you've looked at that videotape, haven't you, the videotape of the move? I know it exists. I don't know that I, no, I don't think I've sat down and documented the videotape. Mr. Garrigus, would you be surprised to learn that that videotape does not show the items being removed from the house? Objection. Misstates the evidence. Overruled. I would be surprised that he took a videotape of not moving after I told him to take a videotape of moving the items or documenting what the items were. Did he ever tell you what the videotape was of? Yes, the items that were placed into storage. All right, did he tell you that, in fact, that videotape was of them cleaning an empty apartment, that that's what it was of? I think that he, I don't know that it was cleaning.
I think he wanted to show what the condition of the apartment was after the move. Did you ask, so there's another videotape? I think it's all one, one videotape. The videotape is of documenting of the items is what I was told, and what the place looked like after the items were out. Do you believe that there exists today a videotape of them documenting the items from Janet Arvizo's apartment? I believe that the video, that there is a videotape and that the videotape is of the items. Did they do a written inventory of the items that they moved from her apartment? I don't know if they did or if the moving place did. I couldn't tell you. Did you ask them to get on videotape Janet Arvizo specifically making that request to have her things moved from that apartment? No, I don't think I told him that. You now believe that Brad Miller is a liar, don't you? Objection. Argumentative. No foundation. Sustained. Did you ever ask Brad Miller why he arranged to have the DCFS interview tape recorded? Objection. Misstates the evidence. Foundation. Personal knowledge. And beyond the scope. Vague as to time. I'm thinking. There's a lot of material. The objections overruled. I don't believe he was the one who did it. I think that Asaf did it, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think Mr. Miller was there at the DCFS. Did you ever ask Brad Miller if he was aware of the fact that Asaf was going to do it? Objection. Vague as to time. At the time it was done. Beyond the scope. Relevance. Sustained. It really is beyond the scope. Did you ever direct Brad Miller to have Janet Arvizo sign a letter that said she wanted her things moved out of that apartment? Objection. Beyond the scope. Relevance. Foundation. I'm sorry? The objection is overruled. Do you want the question read back? No, I remember it. I don't know. I don't know if I did or not. You knew during February and March of 2003 that Janet Arvizo had a prior lawsuit, true? I knew that she had filed a lawsuit, yes. You knew during February and March of 2003 that she had been arrested? I knew that there was a criminal index with some hits involving her. You were very concerned about her involvement with Michael Jackson, true? I had concerns, yes. You contacted Michael Jackson's employees, the ones that were closest to him, and told them of your concerns about Janet Arvizo, is that true? Objection. Beyond the scope. Foundation. Vague as to time. Overruled. You may answer. Is that true? No. That isn't true the way you phrased it. Did you contact Mark Schaffel and express to him your concern about Janet Arvizo? Actually, I was concerned about Schaffel. Did you contact Ronald Konitzer and tell him your concerns about Janet Arvizo? I probably would have told Ronald about my concerns on one of the, on one of our phone calls, yes. During any of those phone calls, did he then tell you that they're sending Janet Arvizo to Brazil? Objection. Beyond the scope. Foundation. Overruled. You may answer. I don't believe he told me that, no. Did you ask Ronald Konitzer to tell you if Gavin Arvizo moved back into Michael Jackson's bedroom? No, I did not tell him to tell me that. Did you have a conversation with Michael Jackson about the Brazil trip? No. I have no further questions. No further questions. You may step down. Oh. I think there was an issue you wanted me to take up. I'm sorry? Mr. Zonin, you want the witness to remain? If he could, yes. To the jury, I'll excuse you for today. And we'll see you Monday at 8.30. Do you want me to remain here? Yes. Your Honor, I know the court's preference is to have these matters done in writing in advance, but we're approaching the end of this trial rapidly. I believe the defense has indicated they might be resting as early as next Tuesday. Given the waiver of both work product and attorney-client privilege, as to Mr. Garrigus's file and the comments as to representation of the defendant and the testimony today, we would make a demand at this time orally, if the court will entertain that, for the production of all emails between Brad Miller and Mr. Garrigus, as well as any notes in his file for that period of time dealing with communications between this witness, Mr. Garrigus, and Mr. Jackson, Mr. Konitzer, Mr. Weisner, Mr. Amen and Mr. Schaffel and Mr. Cassio, as well as the computer files that have been previously the subject of litigation from Brad Miller's office that were previously determined to be inaccessible because of the existence of that privilege.
We believe now that those files should be turned over to us, at least for that period of time, subject to this waiver. And I think that, now that you have the waiver, all that work we did on those computer hard drives, based on the privilege which he subsequently waived, should be turned over. The, let me use the mic for just a second. I just want the court's ruling to, I want to clarify the court's ruling. On Mr. Miller's hard drive, there were communications with Mr. Garrigus. On another case, other cases. No, I'm not ordering you to turn that over. Just on this case. Okay, and you are asking that we turn it over? Yes. Okay. Turn it over. Say, by 5 p.m. tomorrow, Saturday. Yeah, for the, for the period of time of the waiver. I don't think there are any outside of the period. For the period of the waiver, right. If we could have that by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Yes, that's the order. I don't think, I think that takes care of it. I don't think I order. Does that include the email communications as well? The emails, that's primarily what was on that material. I'm not going to limit it to the emails, but obviously on a hard drive between, that was primarily what was there was emails. And I don't know what other material was there, but any other material that you held back because of the privilege between Mr. Garrigus, Brad Miller and Mr. Jackson, you should release. Yes, sir. I think there was a word perfect document, not to get back into that. Yeah. I wonder how we'll ever access it. No, we'll figure it out. I'm not going to order Mr. Garrigus to do that. Could I interject that my only concern is that there's, if there is any email that contains any information related to this case and if it's related to any other case. Well, we know that. Okay. We are very familiar. You know. You don't know this. But we've had, well, maybe you do. But we had a couple. We had an expert go through the computer hard drives with some software that doesn't disturb anything in the drive. It's really unique. And then we had a special master review all of the files and segregate out privileged documents. And then we had Mr. Jackson's team review that before what remained was turned over. So there's, every effort to protect your clients has been followed. Your Honor, I think what he's referring to, I'll just remain seated here and talk into this if that's all right. I think what he's referring to are there are some emails that refer to more than one case, so we would redact the part that refers to other cases. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Then to the extent that that's what you're asking, I grant that. And we have that straight. To the extent that you're asking me to order Mr. Garrigus to turn over something, I'm not going to do that. As long the representation is that they're in possession of what Mr. Garrigus has, then I'm happy with it coming from the defense. Well, I'm not. What we know that they have is what you seized under search warrants of that's fine. That's fine. All right. Then you may step down. Thank you. May I be excused? Then, like the other witnesses, this witness is not excused? You're not excused. You'll remain on call until the case is complete. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. The next issue you wanted to take up was the, which witness was it? Mr. Amen. I didn't know if you were looking at us, but the Vinnie Amen. Yes. Issue. Here's my thoughts on this one. It appears that the Mr. Amen did get a use immunity to talk to the district attorney as it relates to just what happens in their office. They couldn't use that to prosecute him, or any of the fruit of that interview could not be used to prosecute him if they later decided to prosecute him. It's not an immunity that extends to anything that he says in the courtroom, and it's not an immunity that protects him except for what he said to them in their office. Absent an application by the district attorney to the court to grant him immunity, I am without power to grant him immunity on my own. Under the code, it's a procedure that the district attorney has the sole right to institute. If he institutes it, then I have some discretion. But absent that, I can't institute it, so he is not protected. I'll reiterate, he is not protected if called for anything he says here. So if, if you call him and he claims the privilege, then he would not be compelled to answer questions under the Fifth Amendment. If you called him and asked him questions, and he didn't claim the privilege, but then the district attorney called him, or cross-examined him, excuse me, 
and he claimed the privilege, then we'd be somewhat back in the position we were with some of the other witnesses. And so somewhere I would have to, that leaves us with the remedies we had before. You know, either strike his testimony or make him claim the privilege in front of the jury, or, you know, there's, all the same things. Now we've had three or four witnesses that present this issue from, it seems like, a different angle every time. I think there's a little different angle here and I'd like to discuss that. I'm sure there is a little different angle, and I'll let you speak to that. Just let me make sure I've finished saying what I was going to say. Anyway, so the bottom line, I guess, is, we would have to have some indication from him before I let him testify in front of the jury as to what his position on his testimony was going to be. Now, what do you want to say about that special angle? Well, I think this is a little bit of a different angle, and therefore I'd, I don't know if that was the court's ruling or a tentative. No, no, I said that's where I'm going, you know. All right, fine. You're not prevented from trying to show, persuade me otherwise. I think the different angle is this, your honor, that basically the California Supreme Court has left the door open, because we like that reference, to the possibility that there might be a case in which immunity could be granted by the court where the prosecution has not stepped forward and requested it. And I know that the weight of the authority, or the number of cases that are floating around in various jurisdictions and a couple of DCA cases, tend to indicate that there is no such thing as defense immunity. But, or defense requested immunity for a witness. But the reason I think this might be the case that the Supreme Court had in mind or would have left the door open for is that here we have an actual grant of immunity. Now, you recall that Mr. Auchincloss represented to this court that absolutely nothing ever happened, and that whatever happened happened before the tape was turned on, and the officer got it wrong, and the officer didn't understand things. And lo and behold, we got the tape, and he very clearly says, that's the agreement. And his words include, in California, we call it use immunity. So nothing you say in this interview can be used against you, and we can't use the fruits, etc., etc. Now, I understand the court's distinction, that that doesn't say that, when you testify or if you testify, we will ask the court for immunity at that time. That is generally what happens. A witness gives a statement to the prosecution under immunity. They like it. They come in and they ask for immunity, put the person on the stand and get the benefit of it. What happened in this case invokes this small exception that I think the Supreme Court would acknowledge as appropriate. What happened in this case is you have a witness who's debriefed for, I believe it's like four hours, maybe over four hours, on tape. He is asked every imaginable question about this case. He is the witness who was with Janet Arvizo more than anybody else, according to the testimony we have here. And he answers the questions about what happened. What happened when you went to get the passports? What happened? Did she want to go Brazil? All those questions are answered and they are answered in a way that is consistent with the defense position and inconsistent with Janet Arvizo's position. Your Honor, I'm going to object to the description of the facts. That's a matter that is of some contention between the parties. I understand, but I don't know what. I haven't heard the tape, so I can't rule on your objection. Go ahead. And the point is, and the court has, I don't know if the court wants to spend four hours listening to it. The court has the tape. Oh, thank you. I evidently have something to do before Saturday at five o'clock myself, so I thought the court should as well. The point of the story is that you have a key witness in a case, who not only, let us assume, so I don't get in an argument with Mr. Auchincloss, let us assume that his version of events is consistent, it's Brady material, in essence. It's consistent with the weight of the witnesses who have testified, with the exception of Janet Arvizo and her children. And primarily Janet Arvizo, who testifies to all sorts of things that are not consistent with anybody else. They take that witness and they say, well, it was Brady material. We got to turn it over to you, but ha ha, we are now going to revoke our agreement to grant immunity. We're not going to give this person immunity. Object to this characterization. May I make an objection? What? Just that that characterization is completely inaccurate. We are not revoking the informal immunity for this witness for that day's interview. I understand that. That's correct. So they say, okay. We are not going to take the next step and call you as a witness in court and give you immunity. We now know that your testimony is exculpatory, 
so we are going to make it impossible for the defense to present exculpatory evidence to the jury. Now, this is different than the cases that are cited. Because most of the cases that are cited are cases in which, for instance, the defense is trying to call a witness who has not been interviewed by the prosecution, or it's a witness who is a witness on a collateral matter. It's not a witness who has been given immunity to talk to the prosecution first. That's why this is different. He was talked to, he was debriefed for four hours, and he gives exculpatory evidence. And now they say, you can't use it. It was the prosecution who decided to call Mr. Amen an unindicted co-conspirator. It's the prosecution that decided to present him as a criminal wrongdoer, unindicted though he may be, in the eyes of the jury. It's the prosecution that interviewed him. It's the prosecution that chose to give him immunity. And then it's the prosecution that says, King's X, we're not going to let the jury find out what he really has to say. Let me ask you a question. I don't know what the tape says, and I understand just from listening to the two of you that there's, surprisingly, a disagreement over the content. But let me assume for a moment that you're correct, that he tells the series of events exactly what happened from his standpoint, and it in fact supports your position that no crime's been committed in the conspiracy, which is the crime we're talking about on all of the elements, all of the various variations. And that the reason the district attorney doesn't want to call him is because, in fact, he doesn't verify the criminal activities of your client or anyone else. So why would that person just not take the witness stand? testify, and not claim the Fifth Amendment since he's not admitting to any crime? He's only telling the truth and, in fact, verifying, as you point out, what everybody else except Janet Arvizo says. We would very much like him to do that. I think that in the real world, as the court knows, in the real world, a lawyer is going to advise him, and the lawyer has advised him. Everybody's dealing with his lawyer here. The lawyers advised him that he cannot testify. He is being accused of being an unindicted co-conspirator in a very serious case. But they can't prosecute him for anything they learned. And if he says the same thing here, they can't prosecute him, can they? Because they have given him use immunity. Well, if the court takes that position, I think he would come and testify. If. But I think. If he says, your position would be if he says the same thing that he told them that they gave him use immunity for, only he says it in a different room, the use immunity fails. Is that what your position is? No, quite to the contrary. My position is they've given him immunity, and he should be allowed to testify. No, no, no. I understand what your honor said. They just got through saying, Mr. Auchincloss just got through saying it was only for the conversation in the room. Okay, let me talk to him, then. If he testifies and says the same thing that he told you, let's say he doesn't deviate from what he told you under the use immunity. In this courtroom? If he says it in this courtroom, you could prosecute him? Yes. And here's the reason. The use immunity statute provides the prosecution with discretion as to when and where and how it's going to ask for immunity. In virtually every criminal case, the process, and, you know, virtually every, most criminal cases, the process involves a proffer, involves coming into the office, talking to that witness, assessing the credibility, checking the facts against what they say, having the district attorney determine whether this witness is going to be accurate, is going to be telling the truth, is going to be a fit witness in the case to present the facts to the jury. And when the district attorney makes that determination, then it's appropriate for the district attorney to come into court and petition the court for immunity, testimonial immunity which is a completely different creature. Both sides going at it, objections. It's just a different thing than an informal interview. And a proffer is made to the district attorney as far as what he's going to be saying or what he might have to say about the facts of that case. And we provided authority that immunity agreements can be fashioned in a variety of ways, and limitations can be presented, provided for, in those immunity agreements. And it's clear, even from the tape, and while I did tell you there was another discussion that occurred prior to us going onto the tape, but even that little brief colloquy that refers to the discussion that we obviously had just had talks about, today, what said here today, specifically. So, no, the immunity does not extend to trial immunity, immunity in the court, testimonial immunity and a formal grant of immunity. What about the... Just a moment, I'm sorry. Off the record discussion held at council table. Well, 
Mr. Sneddon wanted me to just make sure that I told, that I communicated to you that we believe that if Mr. Amen takes the stand and incriminates himself, he will not be protected. That the immunity, he does not have immunity from what he says on the stand in this case. I understood that. I thought you did. Thank you. Is there another question you had? Yes. Counsel suggested that the Supreme Court has hinted that there's a unique case where the court could grant immunity without you asking me for it. What do you think of that? I think that this court in this case should not go where any court has gone before. Where any court has not gone before? Yeah. I've been doing that for. Don't go where any court has gone before. I thought that's what I've been doing here for the last few months. That may be. That may be. I don't think this is the case where the court should attempt to make new law. Do you believe that's possible, though, that they? No, I don't. It's dicta, and the overwhelming weight of authority is that this is a statutory discretion that the prosecutor has. All right. Well, I am not going to strike out on that trail. So. Then I have another question in that regard. Okay. The court may sense I have a deep belief that this anomaly in the law or what's unresolved in the law results in a true injustice in a criminal case. That bothers me. Yeah. It would seem to me that another remedy the court could fashion, the court having turned down our request that this be clarified, that this man has immunity if he comes in and testifies to the same things he testified or he talked about in the DA's office, if the courts turned that down, then. I turned that down. I would suggest that he is now unavailable as a witness. He has been made unavailable by the acts of the district attorney, and that we should be allowed to, assuming he comes in here and says he's taking the fifth, that makes him unavailable. Not in front of the jury necessarily, but that we then be allowed to play his tape as the statement of a witness who's unavailable. It is a tape that was not created in an adversary situation, but it is a tape that was created based on the questioning of one of the prosecutors seated at this very table and two police officers, a lieutenant and a sergeant. And they had adequate opportunity to confront and cross-examine him and they conducted an extensive interview. There is no harm to the prosecution in allowing that. He's unavailable. I think we should be allowed to do it. I can address that if you need to hear from me. Yes. Well, that doesn't satisfy the former testimony exception to the hearsay rule. It's not former testimony, and there is no exception. Moreover, this particular type of testimony, I don't want to probably even have to go there, but Crawford deals with the issue of a police interview coming in as testimony. So. It does when the district attorney introduces it. But does Crawford, Crawford's about the right of the defendant to have cross-examination, not the people. I agree. I agree. But really the main point is, I mean, I think that an argument could be made that Crawford has applicability. We don't even need to get there. The point is, this is not, there is no exception to the hearsay rule. This is not prior. It's not former testimony under cross-examination from both sides. Thank you. And the court is correct. Crawford is a confrontation clause case, which is a defendant's right. Has nothing to do with this. Well, it does have something to do with it if he, if the district attorney attempted to. Yeah. Introduce his, instead of you being the person who suggested that, they had suggested it, Crawford would apply. Because if you had called him and he answered some questions, and then they asked him some questions and he claims the fifth, and then they said, well, judge, we've got this statement, then you would be screaming Crawford, right? Well, confrontation clause, which is the defendant's right, but not a people's right. Yeah, it's. But I would suggest, though, since we're musing as the day goes on here. Yeah, we're wasting. And it was my day. But that's all right. This is important. You're right. This was your day. It was all of our day. I think it is important. The true hypothetical would be that the defendant makes a long, detailed statement, and then deliberately makes the person unavailable. Or even doesn't deliberately. Just, they become unavailable. Well, I think. You want to say they're deliberately making him. They're deliberately making him unavailable. Go ahead. I see the scenario. Without going into all the details, but, I mean, he explained what was happening at Schaffel's house, who he was working for. He was working for Schaffel, why he rented a car, what he was told to do. 
I know. Everything is there. It's everything the jury wants to know about this case that they haven't heard, and fills in all the spaces between the other legitimate witnesses in this case. Yeah, but truthfully or not truthfully, we don't know the answer to that. All right, that's my ruling on that issue. It is a, it's really a pleasure for a judge to be dealing with both sides who are dealing with very difficult issues and sometimes not resolved. In this case, we've had several situations where we're just dealing with things that there's no law on, and it's a pleasure to see the quality of work that you turn out. It really helps me. Thank you. See you Monday.